Uh, good morning, everyone. You see, endowment lecture series was started uh, a couple of years back, in fact, two years precisely. The purpose of this was that uh, in AIOS we have uh, stalwarts whom uh, everybody would like to listen. And these uh, people are the last words in their subject. And they, I, I believe, uh, when we had launched this series, they are gifted people. You know, God has given them inherent talent. And that is the reason I think uh, uh, we started this. And uh, I, as chairman of Scientific Committee, at, at that time thought that uh, entire membership should know that these are the people in this particular subject. They are the are the leaders. And uh, you see, God gives talent to everybody, but these people are unique, unique because the talent which they have very rarely, uh, you know, it's found in. Uh, uh, most of the people. So uh, I'm very happy that uh, our chairman scientific committee has continued this series of endowment lectures. And today, uh, you know, we have only five endowment lectures here. And uh, all of you have heard these names, Abhay Vasavada and RDR, uh, Jagatram, who have uh, done AIS proud by winning so many international awards. I remember Jagatram winning best of the best series in uh, in American Academy. Then. Uh, Colonel Desh, Desh Pandey, and then uh, Professor Azad. So we'll begin uh, opening batsman, uh, Dr. Abhay Vasavada. So he's here to uh, deliver this AIUS uh, Daljit Singh Endowment Lecture. Daljit Singh, as we all know, was uh, you know one of the pioneers of uh, cataract surgery, and uh, he is famous for his iris claw lens. So therefore, uh, since it is pertaining to cataract, we thought uh, none better than uh, Abhay to deliver this uh, endowment uh, lecture on AIS Daljit Singh Endowment Lecture. Abhay. Thank you. Abhay. Thank you, Lalit and uh, Parsa for such a wonderful concept. And uh, I wish this will keep improving as the time goes, as we keep learning uh, and the logistics and other things that uh, we give a deserving respect to this, those legions on which we deliver the lectures. But. Uh, uh, I'm really privileged and honored to give this, and uh, Dr. Daljit Singh was known for his uh, innovations of which the Iris Claw Lens was worldwide, and he really was uh, uh, very popular. He also devised many useful uh, gadgets and small instruments at that time, by manual IA, for example, and it changed the extracapsular cataract surgery, and then also on the lymphatics, the subject which uh, very few people got interested in it. So I can go on on his uh, innovation because he really was a visionary, he was an innovator, but at the same time, he was very direct. He was very bold to take the risks, and and good part is that he was uh, taken up very well by the society members because he was a great human being. So I really uh, salute to, to him and his family who has continued, I believe, in uh, uh, doing these maverick tricks as if were, uh, uh, you know, and this is one of those ultimate Irish claw lens that Kiranjit and Ravijit have developed. So um, I uh, do receive research grant support for, from Alcon, but it has nothing to do with this my presentation, which is mainly on the on the years that I spent in the subject and the life that I I think is important for the younger people to share. And before I do that, I acknowledge the educators worldwide, the experts in the subjects, my colleagues. Uh, trainees in particular, but most importantly the patients uh, who really uh, gave me all this thing. But if I have to name one or two persons, it would be Dr. P. N. Nakpal and Dr. G. N. Rao, who really have influenced me individually speaking, uh, so I, I thought I would recognize them. But what my philosophy has been to, to from the practice that I was, I started doing to professoring in my life so that I can uh, uh, improve myself primarily and also uh, help the science and, and uh, hopefully benefit the patients. So I think uh, doing that in a private practice, and I wanted, I was determined to do that right from the word goes, and that's basic philosophy. And the lessons I learned as a clinician, as a surgeon, and as a clinical researcher are many, but if I enumerate uh, very fundamental things as a 
as a, as a kind of a general philosophy, I think it's very fundamental, elementary, that we try to be helpful and sympathetic, give enough time and listen to the mm -hmm. patients. You may have 200 patients waiting in the OPD, and I saw that many of these uh, very popular exactly. organization where they're loaded with the patients. So that's, uh, that's an issue. But, but approach them not as a eye disease, but and a general well-being, their health, and, and, and take interest in them. But it's saddening that human aspects of medical practice is really going down worldwide. So we are not the only one, but this is something we need to pay attention and try to address as much as we can. And, and uh, formulating a team with the other medical specialities of our own super specialists is something now a necessity, even if you don't believe in the academics and so on. And, and, f and, and it's, it's, you know, you must keep all the time uh, when a patient sits across you in the slit lamp, do what you would have done to you and your family, and always and always respect when you face, confront a clinical scenario in a patient, respect your colleagues and support them if, if, if you, as much as you can, whether it's a medical intervention, surgical, and, 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 and be a family, be a team. That is very important, and I think it's, it's, it's getting uh, sidelined with this competition and with the, with the stress and stress that we all uh, go through this in our uh, presently world. But the surgical tips are innumerable. I don't want to go through the details, but they, you must recognize there is a need and necessity to re keep refining our performance as a clinician, as a surgeon, as a researcher, and, and make this very predictable, consistent, and, and better. And the first step would be the pre-operative evaluation or pre-intervention evaluation. Give a dedicated time slot, not as a routine OPD. We have a separate time slot for this, where the consultant, the technicians, all are separate. They have nothing to do with the OPD. They just have plenty of time, 10 patients in four hours, and they spend all the time so that uh, they, we understand and give, deliver what uh, is expected. And there are many, many technical details, a cataract surgeon, and same thing would be applied to all the specialists. But I just want to take a few minutes on this uh, attention to the posture capsule, and, and that is something is, is now a kind of a evolution in last uh, recent time, and you can uh, perform it in several ways and take the advantage of that capsule surgery. This is one of these which is known as the optic capture, which, which uh, stabilizes the lens well, but also in children uh, would uh, dispense away with the need for vitrectomy uh, and still maintain the posterior capsule clarity and central axis. So you can consider that in various applications, this is a traumatic cataract with compromised bag. <coughs> posterior capsule is intact. And still uh, I perform the PCCC because <clears throat> Otherwise, the lens stability would not be very predictable. So this is the same eye, well-centered, well-stable eye, well. But this is something which is very fresh and new. I don't have enough experience. I've done less than 10 of these cases. But if you see a very advanced angle closure glaucoma, which are likely to develop malignant glaucoma, as you can see here, with all forward bulge and everything, uh, and you really don't know what to do. Uh, people do vitrectomy, do yeah, capsulotomy, and so on. But if you approach it differently and put the haptics in the ciliary sulcus of the three-piece IOL and capture through ACCC and PCCC, please quiet there, please. Uh, the guys, be quiet. Uh, uh, it, uh, you can really uh, uh, reconstruct the anti-segment and rotation of ciliary body and so on, and no fear of malignant glaucoma. So I think... And summarizing, keep uh, in mind, performing the surgery in the posture capsule can be rewarding at times. And I think it should be in our momentorium of every cataract surgeon or any surgeon, wherever you face with this. And likewise, there are many uh, little tricks. All of us have developed uh, several. I will just keep up these. And some challenging cases need to be uh, dealt with very methodically in a step by step manner and, and learn from the stalwarts and, and the experienced uh, colleagues that will teach you how to deal with this. But one of the things uh, uh, with the vitreo retinal surgeon already had that uh, in terms of the IOP, the set and thing, the cataract anti segment surgeon never had that. Then we realized that if you put a very high bottle height, uh, 
uh, you produce a lot of high IOP and fluctuation versus low IOP and uh, uh, low flow rate and so on. So I think that has been translated onto the impact of these uh, procedures on the anterior and posterior segment of the eye and uh, make it very safe and a controlled procedure. But finally, of the techniques and surgery, I just want to pay attention to this cortical aspiration, which has been taken as a rut. Nobody, I never paid attention for the last 40 years. I just, uh, what was happening, I was removing the cortex. I didn't pay attention how I should do it and why we should do that. So I think uh, <clears throat> our colleagues reported this technique, they called it POPS technique. Uh, uh, what it means is that aspiration port is positioned under the anterior cortex occluding the cortex and then taking it a little bit posteriorly. Remember the anterior capsule and the posterior capsule. Anterior capsule is an epithelium and a villi which bind the anterior cortex. Nothing like that on a posterior capsule, very free. So you need to detach it and if, because they are like that, if you pull it radially, you can uh, produce stress. Instead of that, take it posteriorly, detach it, the anterior cortex from the epithelial attachments and so therefore you need to displace the aspiration port which is occluded posteriorly and then swipe it from the fornix to reduce the stress on the zonules and also to, to remove the epithelial cells as much as you can. This is the first thing. Position the aspiration port under the anterior cortex. You can do it same in the coaxial as well but by manual would do a better job. You can concentrate on animation uh, on the side peep uh, occlude it with 100 millimeter or so of the vacuum, and then the, this is a very critical step. Tilt the aspiration port posteriorly because you, you can understand the cortex is attached to the anterior epithelial cells. There are no epithelial cells in the posterior capsule. So you need to detach it in a right ergonomical direction, and that's what it is. And then you swipe the fornicial attachment. Uh, with the epithelial cells and then the uh, anterior and the posterior capsule. And once it is detached uh, substantially, the next thing is to just push the paddle and, and finally aspirate with the way you want to do it. And why we should be doing it? Dr. Samresh Srivastava uh, showed it very elegantly on this, machine, on this uh, animation, where in a conventional cortex removal where we pull it radially, uh, quite often because of the high high aspiration force, those cortex can detach it and leave behind uh, the epithelial cells, which are the, which are the predecessors of the posterior capsule opacification. Instead, if you take time and if you go through that ordeal of that technique that we just mentioned, there are more chances that you will be able to, to remove the uh, epithelial cells a little more extensively or, or quite often completely. But this is a, something which was a nightmare for me, and I learned from my posterior segment colleagues. And this is uh, for number one that you must stain the vitreous triamcinolone. And and every time I had a vitreous for many years, my PCR would enlarge. It was started with small, and suddenly it becomes large, and uh, I never understood why. But once I uh, picked up the pars plana approach, where the retractor goes to the pars plana, but irrigation from the anterior chamber, uh, things change. Uh, you can do a sclerotomy with lens knives with peritomy or use this kind of uh, devices which will allow you to use repeatedly uh, entry and exit. But notice, it simply drains into that vitreac, uh, vitreac, vitractor, that vitreous, and now I can remove the cortex as if there's uh, nothing has happened and then complete that procedure. I, I show it once again to illustrate and highlight how uh, less traumatic it is uh, to the posterior capsule tear, but also uh, to the posterior segment. This is what once again somebody sh showed us how adequately you can remove the anterior vit vitreous from the chamber without affecting, impacting the tear. And uh, what happens if you do top-down approach where you do it uh, from the front because of the unique anatomy of the vitreous. So I think uh, some of these tricks uh, I learned uh, over the years, and I thought would be interesting for you. Uh, uh, finally, uh, we don't need to be a researcher. Uh, what is a research? Research is nothing but have a curiosity in mind and try to address that curiosity. And how do you do that? The best research is by a methodical, well-taken observation. There, nothing can beat, no bench, bench uh, research would beat that 
well taken uh, methodical observations. And then you can translate that uh, with the bench research if you have into the real world. But, but it's, it's, it, it may find that intimidating, but that clinical research is not. It is something that be sense, develop common sense, and it, try to address the problem. Whatever we do, remember, this is what is, we are doing all about. We are not doing to increase our practice or have a glamour or so that I can speak from the podium, but, but uh, it is for these people that we are doing. And finally, this is what I learned hard way later on, and there are young guys I see who keep doing it, and they, had, they were enlightened earlier than me, but keep taking care of yourself. Nobody is going to take care. Uh, we are learning hard way. Nobody bothers about us. And take care of your ergonomics when you do, when you examine, when you operate. Uh, try to remain fit, whatever you want to do, whatever procedure or activity you want to do, but try to take care of yourself. And I'm blessed with those people who are like-minded here, and we, we keep doing such activities uh, at our place, uh, uh, not very regularly, but uh, sometimes. And I thank them, my team at REH, and I also thank my family, uh, and I really, I owe them a lot, both the families. And without their team effort, uh, clinical and academic success and hard to come by. Finally, I hope, like uh, late Dr. Daljit Singh, I also wish to leave behind a legacy for my younger friends uh, of uh, developing a curiosity when you see a patient or talk to them, sharing it with your colleague. That's very important. Don't keep it to yourself. You will not grow otherwise. And, and grow, therefore, with each other, and uh, try to be, uh, keep your feet on the ground as much as you can. So thank you so very much for your patient hearing. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, see, now we know why Avay is away. The surgeon in great demand, uh, you see. Uh, uh, thank if, you. Uh, I have to, you know, seek appointment. I have to ring him up directly rather than uh, he's such a great demand. Thank you, but, thank uh, you. But AS is privileged to present to you this shawl. Oh. Uh, you see, uh, honor will happen during inauguration, but in this session, if, I, if you can just give, come forward. Today, uh, I believe that endowment series of lectures uh, uh, is the, the highest kind of, uh, you know, uh, academic uh, programs in AIS today because there are five things uh, we, we bestow upon the speaker apart from, uh, you know, shawl, this is a small thing, but there's a huge memento, including cash, this thing also. Cash does not make much, but it's an honor for them. It's the way AIS thinks about uh, these uh, great luminaries. So I request Dr. Partha Biswas to call the next. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, I would request the presence of uh, Dr. R.D. Ravindran, sir, to come up and uh, give the endowment lecture of AIOS Gulapali Rao endowment lecture. Dr. Gulapali Rao is a renowned ophthalmologist of international fame. He was a fellow of the National Academy of Medical Sciences India. He was honored by the government of India with Padma Shri, elected by the American Society of Cataract and Refractive Surgeon. And after completing his medical education in Guntur, Andhra Pradesh, completed his postgraduate residency training at All India Institute, received the Doctor of Science honor, Honoris Causa by the University of Melbourne, and many, many other awards. We have the pleasure of having delivered the endowment lecture by Dr. R.D. Ravindran. And Dr. R.D. Ravindran is man on a mission to eliminate blindness, leading the fight against blindness through world-class eye care system. He says, as a leader, you have to be focused on how constantly develop, you develop the people. He began his career under Dr. G. Venkat Swami, the founder of Arvind Eye System. When Arvind built its first center, he was designated as the chief medical officer. He took over as chairman of AECS in 2010, and today, under the leadership, the institution has grown to one of the best eye care, eye care system in the world today, with 
nearly 23 years as chief medical officer of several urban centers. We have the pleasure of Dr. Adi Ravindra. As you know, I think urban model is the only system which has been quoted in the Time magazine. You see, I was so thrilled to see, uh, Pandey, you must remember, there's a in the Time magazine front cover, and it gave such a proud feeling to us that it was quoted world over. Congratulations. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. Uh, this is also not. Uh, can you switch? Yeah. So thanks, uh, Dr. Lalit, uh, Dr. Parthas, and the AOS team for this honor to deliver the Dr. Gulapalli Endrov Endowment Lecture on the th theme of science of ophthalmology and my philosophy. I'm really honored to give this talk named after. Uh, Dr. Gulapalli Rao, who created an excellent and equitable eye care model in LV Prasad, covering four states and probably covering more than about 120, 130 million population in that area. If you look at the science of ophthalmology, we all know that it's about covering patients, I mean, caring for patients who are blind or visually impaired. With the recent advances in the basic sciences, now we are able to diagnose some of the difficult conditions, immunological, genetic conditions. And we also, not only we can diagnose, we also have new drug molecules, newer biologicals, gene therapy to treat them. And uh, we also have newer surgical technologies, you know, which you go out, you'll be able to see it, and you are able to give the best of the care to the patients. And at the same time, it's also about inequity in the care delivery. A large number of patients who are disadvantaged socioeconomically. If you take the women, the, the prevalence of blindness is 36% higher. It's much, much three to four times higher in Ill illiterates and also in unemployed people. And today, the current health system, the way we have designed our system, don't address the access challenges of this underserved population. Even more important, the, with the development of ophthalmology, the modern ophthalmology also have become complex. For example, if you take cataract surgery, there are at least three or four surgical options available. There are about 20 or 25 intraocular lenses available. The power ranges from minus 10 to plus 30. All of this makes the whole eye care very error prone. And uh, if you, there was a, recently there was an article in the year 2018, looking at the, uh, the surgical errors which happen in surgery, not just ophthalmology surgery, they, the surgery the period covered for about seven years, and it's in the Veterans Administrative Hospitals in America. They looked at about 32 lakh procedures done over a period of seven years. They found there were about 277 surgical er errors. So it's not just ophthalmology, but all the other specialties as well, as well as but because of the protocols, they were able to prevent about 206 other errors. If you look at what are the common errors, they operated on the wrong side, including a wrong lung, a wrong implant in about 86 patients, and a wrong site, you know, wrong vertebra, wrong uh, uh, the, the teeth was you know, operated in about 65 cases. And you know, this, uh, the 277 covers all the specialties. But if you see what comes on the top, the 72 out of the 277 were ophthalmic cases. And if you look at what is the average error, it's about 1 per 20,000 across all specialties. But if it comes to ophthalmology, it's 1 in 10,000. Ophthalmology is almost, the, the chances for error is almost double. And the most common root cause for the error is not performing a, a comprehensive timeout, which could have prevented this in nearly 30% of the cases. This is again reinforced by another paper that was published by Arcase Ophthalmology. They comprehensively covered about 900,000 surgical procedures done in the state of New York for about during a period of five years. And they reported there are about one incident, surgical error incident per 15,000 surgeries, which includes a wrong lens implant, wrong eye, wrong block, wrong procedure, wrong imp the transplant. Here again, a safety protocol could have prevented about 85% of the cases. So as my journey, I mean, I've been the chief medical officer of different hospitals for the last 25 years, and as a chairman for the last 10 years, 
and also as a, as a director. My main aim is to how do we deliver quality eye care to the large volume of patients who come, especially those, which also includes a large number coming from rural areas who are illiterate. And of that, I really attach a lot of importance to safety. So let us understand, I give you a few examples how errors happen. So here is a rare scenario where a patient has been advised left eye cataract surgery. The advice was correct. The whatever you know, documents that were generated, biometry sheet, consent process, everything was normal, correct for the left eye. But a doctor, when he gave the block, he gave the block in the right eye, opposite eye. Because it was noticed during the time out in the operating room, it was prevented. It is called active failure. So where everything else is normal, you know, your process, everything is normal, but the person who is delivering the care makes a mistake, we call it as an active failure, acute failure, it's very difficult to address it. And this is something really people have to pay attention to that. But what is common is, it's usually lack of a safety culture, which is about, talks about the policy. It's about the lack of pro protocol and processes. It's about lack of having a proper technology to prevent these errors and lack of communication. So it's not the people, you know, all these errors, you know, what the people make prior, the people at the end of point where they deliver the care, they make the mistake. So it's not the people, but it's the whole system that makes the mistake. So let us look at another scenario. There was a lapse in a documentation where a patient was advised to write a DCR the admission counter staff entered it as a left eye and all the subsequent documents were generated for the left eye, a transcription error which could have led to a wrong surgery in the, for that particular patient. Similarly, at a point, you know, just to improve the, the post-operative refractive error, we moved from applination to immersion method and suddenly we noticed a patient with a large refractive error. The reason being it was done using immersion method but they used an applanation mode. So all these errors, you know, whether, so, but the you know, majority of the, we think the majority of the errors result from individual recklessness or action of a particular group of people, but it is not so. It is because of the faulty system, faulty processes and conditions that led people to make the, these errors. Yeah. So I'll just share some of the principles of patient safety for eye care as we have learnt it over a period of time. The foremost important thing is how do you increase awareness about patient safety in your team? How do you create clarity to staff on different dimensions of quality and safety? And you know, we had held workshops way back in 2010 and 11, just openly discussing how safe or unsafe is our hospital. We asked everybody to talk openly as to what goes wrong each, in each of their hospital because to err is a human. We also did the root cause analysis we introduced a JCA, you know, patient safe, safety goals as we understood at that point of time, but was re, which was really difficult for our staff to understand. But at the same time, we also brought in a culture of reporting. So we brought in a, a reporting page right in our intranet page, which is you know, accessible to every staff of the hospital. They have to just click on that incident reporting page. And it comes out a page where you know, it's very simple to enter all the details. The whole thing is anonymous, you don't have to disclose your name unless you want to do it. So once you do it, a mail is generated and sent to the chief medical officer, the quality in charge doctor and also the, to the manager and who take, you know, do the root cause analysis and do what is necessary. So this reporting also helps us to kind of a really define what are the patient safety goals. We have put together about 10 goals, not including the the correct eye surgery, correct eye oil power, how do we prevent, minimize the mortality, how do we minimize the endophthalmitis, how do we avoid medical diagnostic errors, medication errors, spectacles, all of this we were able to cover in that. And the fourth thing you have to make, you know, you have to make, you know, if you want to avoid this, you have to make your staff understand that safety is related to the work process. The reasons, you know, or the causes for error in our hospital will be very different from another hospital. So, so once you understand that, you can create system. The problem in Aravind is that one person does one work, so which as a result, we have multiple handovers. So errors relating to patient identification can happen. So we really stress on the identification protocol. If it's an OPD patient, it is a must that you use the ID card to identify the patient. 
it's an inpatient, you have to use the wristband to identify the patient. So, this, you know, so developing that culture is also very important. And we also brought in a you know, standardized time mode safety checklist over a period of time. And again, training across the system is very, very important. For each of the areas, we created safety protocols. We have about 30 such protocols covering all the areas that is shared with across everybody who is involved in the particular area. And we also have created you know, posters which were displayed in the work area so that it's easy for them to refer to. And again, we also said you know, what a biometrist can report. A biometrist can report if a wrong guy has been advised by a doctor. If there is an interchange of the diagnosis, if the doctor has missed the silicon oil in the diagnosis, whether, you know, whether he has missed a multifocal eye oil in the other eye, whether there was a wrong ID card. Similarly, any mistake made by the biometrist is picked up by a ward nurse or OT nurse and, and is reported. And again, constant monitoring is very important. Without the data, you cannot do it. I'm just sharing the data for 2019, wherein we had seen close to about 9 lakh outpatients and performed about 1.6 lakh surgical procedures and lasers, and there were about 490 incidents were reported. A lot of that you can see it's a missing documentation, wrong documentation, patient identification error. But we had three safety events, three of that was a wrong guy block and a one wrong lens design. So if you have something like this, you have to also go back to the board and understand why this is happening. For example, a wrong eye block, we were used to make a single mark. Just to avoid this wrong eye block, we also made create a two uh, markings. Even that did not help, as you can see. So once then we made sure that you know, this was being done by a doctor individually. So we made sure that one more person will stand with the doctor to make sure that you know, as a team they don't make a mistake. So for the last 18 months, I can say there was only one single error relating to this. And again, it's also important to use the technology. Since we have moved to EMR, we have mandated certain things, what you call as a rule engine. So unless you enter the ID number of the patient, the record will not open. So you have to get the ID card from the patient. You no know, certain number is available only with the patient. And again, the doctor can advise, you know, right eye, but he can tick the left eye in the EMR. Just to make sure it doesn't happen here, a pop-up will come, a doctor has to you know, say yes or no, only then you know, you'll, you'll be able to move on. And again, there used to be uh, IVO related uh, issue errors in the substore, so we had brought in a system where the IVO has to be scanned. So a lot of things you know, goes into the system. So scan and if it matches with the EMR data only then the nurse will be able to issue that. So bringing in the, some of those technologies is also very important. Again, more important is how do we involve everybody in the hospital. So today we have about close to 40 teams across the hospitals and they, about 700 to 800 people are involved. They are all champions. Everybody is involved, but there are about 700, 800 champions we have created. Just to conclude, you know, the safety errors in eye care is very common because it's a bilateral organ. There's a high volume specialty. We have multiple treatment options, multiple measurements, more than that large number of our patients are very vulnerable. So ensuring safe eye care becomes really important. So it's important that we do that in each one of our practice. So each one of you need to identify where errors happen in your practice. Understand how they happen. Reduce the complexity and develop reliable process for each of that. A create independent checks for key processes. And you know, creating the culture of safety it should not be just done as a work, but it is, has to come really out of involvement for the patient. So you need to create not just one role model, but you know, role models and teams across the team, across the hospital. That is how you know, we'll be able to take care of this problem. I really chose this particular topic. This is something very least talked about in our meetings. I feel that we need to really give importance in the scenario of you know, rising medical legal. Uh, cases across our country. Thanks a lot. Again, I thank the opportunity to share this work with all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir.
our next AIOS endowment lecture is named after uh, Professor L. P. Agrawal. Professor L. P. Agrawal is a legend in his own way. He was the founder of the Dr. R. P. Center for Ophthalmic Sciences, named after the first president of India. And he was instrumental in setting up the national program for the control of blindness, which was perhaps the first in the world that any country set up a national program exclusively for the control of blindness. And Professor Agrawal was not just a great teacher, a mentor who literally trained generations of ophthalmologists, but he also realized, like Dr. G. Venkataswamy, that this is not something that can be done only by doctors. So he also started paramedic training and diploma in ophthalmic techniques. And he also started a federation of eye care institutions to promote vision sciences the Federation of Ophthalmic and Optometry Research and Education Center. This year, the All India Ophthalmology Society is proud to confer the AIOS LP Agrawal Endowment Lecture on Professor Jagat Ram Sir, again a living legend. He was the head of Department of Ophthalmology at the prestigious Postgraduate Institute of Medical Research and retired as its director a world-renowned pediatric ophthalmologist. He's also been confirmed Padma Shri by the President of India. In 2019, he completed 40 years in PGI-MR. We look forward to hear from you, Professor, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I am thankful to All India Ophthalmological Society. Uh, they are not present here. Dr. Varun Nayak, President. Dr. Harbans Lal, Dr. Lalit Verma, Dr. Namrata Sharma, uh, those present here, uh, Dr. Partha Vishwa, Chairman Scientific Committee, Dr. Prakshit Gogate, uh, for uh, considering me for uh, a prestigious Dr. L.P. Agarwal Endowment Lectures. It is a, a great honor and opportunity for me. My regard to my respected senior colleagues delivering endowment lectures, uh, Dr. Abhay Vasavada, Dr. R.D. Ravindran, Dr. Madan Desh Pandey, Prof. Rajwardhan Azad, and other colleagues, and uh, all the uh, dear delegates. Uh, a topic uh, given is uh, the science of ophthalmology and my philosophy. Prof. L.P. Agarwal has already said a legendary and visionary ophthalmologist of the country founder chief of Dr. R.P. Center for Ophthalmic Sciences. He planned the first ever blindness control program of India, national program for control of blindness. He received several prestigious awards like gold medal for research in trachoma eradication from World Health Organization and Lifetime Achievement Award. His contribution to the modern Indian ophthalmology were so profound that he can be aptly called the father of modern Indian ophthalmology. As for any person, guru is most important and whether it is a spiritual guru or worldly guru. I owe my sincere gratitude to the founding father of our institute at PJMER Chandigarh. These were the director before me. I also owe my gratitude to my mentor and teachers. I had opportunity to work with Professor Ayajan and for long time Professor Amod Gupta. I owe my gratitude to my mentor and uh, uh, in pediatric cataract surgery. While working with uh, Dr. David Apple, who is my inspiration, uh, I also got opportunity to work with Dr. Emmy Wilson uh, in Charleston, USA, that initiated my major interest in pediatric cataract surgery. I consider Professor uh, Dr. Abhay Vasabada pioneer uh, of modern pediatric cataract surgery in the country, and he is my inspiration. My family has been greatest pillar of strength and uh, 
have constantly provided me positive store, uh, support and affection every day. This is the photograph in 1990 and now uh, other photograph is 2022. Uh, you can see uh, Professor Ayajan, Professor Amod Gupta, uh, Professor Dogra uh, worked uh, together for 40 years and now I am after uh, retirement I am working with uh, Dr. SPS Grewal. Uh, this is our young team at PJMER Chandigarh faculty and uh, we were there for uh, 42 years together. The progress over the century in ophthalmology has been due to intellectual curiosity and passion of, for science. Uh, whether it is the uh, first uh, ophthalmologist uh, which we consider Dr. Sushrita or uh, Sir Harold Ridley or Kelman. As I trace my route, it makes me immensely surprised and emotional to note how far one can reach by sheer hard work and persistent dedication. Uh, this story is of 42 year in 1979 while I joined PGI uh, started with intracapsular cataract surgery 1985 extracapsular cataract surgery with the PCIUL then phaco emulsification with posterior chamber IOL implantation and uh, later in 2010 with uh, femato surgery femato cataract surgery lot of work has been done in the community of ophthalmology, contributed free services to over 150 mega camps in Punjab, Haryana, Himachal and Chandigarh since 1979, provided free surgical services in the mega eye camps at Radha Swami Satsang Bias. I had opportunity to serve the Republic of Seychelles on deputation from PGI as a consultant ophthalmologist from 2003 to 5 and successfully eliminated the backlog of cataract blindness that time. It was an honor to write a complete issue of survey of ophthalmology in 2000, elimination of cataract blindness, a global perspective entering new millennium, and to analyze the largest database of the world of the pseudophagic human eye obtained post-mortem, and both these publications made global impact. It was also honored to publish in New England Journal of Medicine, which is a high impact factor journal. And introduce uh, uh, an artificial platform for intraocular lens implantation in a fake patient with inadequate support, uh, which is under patenting. From the small beginning, year after year, I have diligently worked to serve the thousands of the children who were brought with billions of the hope at our doorstep and to educate hundreds of the young mind who want to become leader of ophthalmology tomorrow. Why pediatric cataract surgery? Pediatric cataract surgery is a neglected surgical procedure in ophthalmology, high rate of complication most uh, powerful draw was preventing childhood blindness due to pediatric cataract. This became my biggest passion, mission and obsession. I, I developed completely focused motivation and strong will to turn that into reality. These are some of the publications in pediatric cataract surgery uh, with high impact factor. While these children come to us, they come with visually significant cataract, most of the time bilateral and sometimes even unilateral. And we dilate each of the eye and see the anatomy of the cataract. There are several issues of concern uh, or uh, consideration which has to be done in these children. Dilated seldom examination is important. IL power calculation increase in axial length of these growing eyes, IL implantation or uh, uh, to be done or not, these they may get uh, marked inflammation postoperatively, management of amblyopia. Aim is to provide a clear visual axis and, 
visual long term visual rehabilitation uh, this is a very small i don't want to teach uh, pediatric cataract surgery but uh, this is a very small uh, video clip to sh show how we teach uh, uh, to our uh, resident and trainee ophthalmologist uh, after making side port and main incision uh, doing continuous curvilinear capsular axis removal of the cortex after uh, hydro dissection and then making the posterior capsulotomy in younger children younger than 6 years and completion of the posterior rexis which is kept about uh, 3.5 or so and then uh, in the bag implantation of hydrophobic acrylic IOL. And even uh, at present uh, we also did study on uh, femato cataract surgery in pediatric much more commonly is toric IOL implantation and selectively multifocal IOL implantation. These are some of the publications in the field of persistent fetal vasculature with cataract. Seeing the contribution uh, more than 12,000 uh, 12, pediatric cataract surgery, 134 publication out of 450 are in the field of pediatric cataract. 172 lecture including orations, mentoring of resident uh, in ophthalmology 154 for the last 42 years, award and honors uh, more than 30 award in the field of pediatric cataract surgery. Uh, surgery is just the first step, long term follow, is uh, follow up is important. Uh, see this child uh, where we did, I did cataract surgery with uh, uh, primary posterior capsulotomy and anterior vitrectomy that point of time in 1997 and the same child after 25 year uh, having 20 by 20 visual acuity has grown up now doctors after completion of MBBS. <laughs> Ophthalmology in general and pediatric uh, cataract surgery in uh, particular has been my life and it is it has given me many moments to be proud of these are some of the award innovative surgical on innovative surgical procedure which brought global recognition for advanced eye center pgi and uh, these are some of the best of the best award and oscar of pediatric ophthalmology and small clip i will like to play Now the winner in this category reminds me, I, I watched this video over and over and over. As some of you know, I have loved magic from the time I was a child. As I watched this video, I realized that the producer had to love magic too. In producing this video, you can see the level of skill, compassion, and technology that went into showing what we as ophthalmologists can ideally do. This is magic. The winner is management of double crystalline lens. Jagat Ram from Chandigarh, India. This was another uh, uh, moment uh, which was, uh, I'm proud of that Jagat moment. Ram Chikitsa Netribhigyan. Uh, 
another uh, proud moment for me was while I became director of PGIMER Chandigarh. Uh, very difficult, uh, but anyway, uh, it was not political. Uh, my philosophy, uh, in order to achieve excellence, we need to take a small step every day. I will not go into detail. Uh, positive and high thinking. Be a lifelong student. Have deep level of interest in the career you choose. To excel, you must teach. Hard work and dedication. Focus is the most important step. Pursue, innovate and invent. Take failure in your stride. And what I consider one of the most important is team approach and harmony. You can see three of us at PGIMER Chandigarh. We have worked for uh, more than 42 years together without any fight. And another is professional connectivity. Share your knowledge with your colleagues, with your, uh, with your senior and juniors. I believe in empowering the next generation for progress. These are my residents, Dr. Anirudh Agrawal, Dr. Anand Vinekar and Dr. Simar Agrawal. They got top award nationally and the best, the gold medal too. Once again, I thank all the children, more than 10,000 children were, uh, who gave me opportunity to serve them and I am thankful to All India Ophthalmological Society for giving me this opportunity uh, to, for uh, delivering uh, this uh, Dr. L.P. Agarwal endowment lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor, sir. It is again my proud privilege to announce the uh, Dr. Nam Parimal Swami uh, endowment lecture. Dr. Nam Parimal Swami is one of the founding members of Aravind Eye Care System and currently it's uh, Chairman Emeritus and Professor of Ophthalmology. Started his career at Government Rajaji Eye Hospital and then he has made one of the biggest institutions of the world today. We have the AIOSP Namparamal Swami Endowment Lecture in his name. And this year, Dr. Colonel Madan Desh Pandey is requested to give the Endowment Lecture. Sir, please. <laughs> Dr. Madan Desh Pandey has accredited the conception and development of HV Desai Eye Hospital, which was set up in the year 2000. He is the chief architect. He gave the technical advice and the expertise the hospital has its quality service delivery, education, skill transfer, and it is a research center. He has done a huge amount of capacity building, strategy planning, and quality review of two partner hospitals all across the country. Presently mentoring 12 eye hospitals from Gujarat, Andhra Pradesh, MP, Maharashtra for quality, capacity, and strategic planning. He was president of Vision 2020, the right to cite India, from July 2011 to June 2014. We have with us today, and we are proud to have uh, Dr. Madan Deshpande give this oration. Thank you, sir. I'm uh, thankful to AIOS uh, for this great opportunity. And indeed, it is a great to express our gratitude to our stalwarts and the elders for setting the pace of development. Dr. Nam Parmasamy was one of them. And he, along with Nature and other Arvind members, have done the wonders. So much so, the work they have done, it appears that Islands have done this. 
talking about this uh, topic of uh, philosophy with uh, science, uh, we thought that you know, it helps to develop the basic sciences and increase the social awareness, the newer technology and accurate diagnosis and treatment, because you have to have always inquiry, questions, and this causes universal advances and capabilities. Absolutely, I thought that the science relates mostly with the practice, what we do that. And uh, either it, a philosophy evolves with the practice or we set our practice with the philosophy. Keeping this in mind, I thought that whatever I faced in my life, I would like to put it on uh, modestly, this thing. Early time, when I was in, after my basic uh, MBBS, I joined army and I was in a uh, field area, I was in both wars, I was in field area in the sense of snowbound area, then uh, 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 this desert during the summer. I was a paratrooper, I did commando. I thought as far, far away from even, forget about ophthalmology, I was away from medicine itself. I thought I wasted my time, but no. That is the time I got capacity building in me, which was useful to me when later on in my life. During our postgraduate days, those days, everything depended upon one person, that is professor. He would uh, whether pass you or fail you. And it was most of a self-learning. We are seen regularly doing the work, but we are not supposed to express, talk. Then an army, there is a peculiar system. Where whatever degrees you have got, when you go to army uh, with your degrees to become a specialist, they are referred to a senior advisor. He watches you, observes you for three months. And then uh, whether you are practically, skillfully fit or not, he will decide and recommend you. Otherwise, you remain a general duty officer. So I went to Colonel Siota, Ramanji's father. He was a very hard task master. He gave a hard look at me and he said, what all you have done? I don't care what fancy degrees you have got. I want to know what you know today. And he asked me to few theory questions. I was fresh. I answered. Then he asked me to his slit lamp. Those days slit lamp was a rarity, you know. I said, sir, I've seen one, but I don't know. So he said, I'll teach you. This man taught us, and uh, I would say that it was the work was so hard, we never see, saw sunrise, sunset in our house. We used to work in the ward. And uh, then the seeds of community ophthalmology were with me because I'm from a village. So was the Nam Parma Swami uh, from village. And uh, uh, I forgot to mention that whole Arvind culture is such that they, they live philosophy, they exude philosophy. Uh, just now, before no, Dr. Uh, uh, Ravi spoke, I remember one incident. I had gone to Arvind for some workshop and my baggage didn't arrive with me. I had to give a talk in the morning. At 5.30 in the morning, Chairman Arvind knocks my do room door with a set of clothes trouser, pant, you know, whatever, you know, shirt and everything, including my details of handkerchief. I told Ravi, look, I respect all of you, but today you are in my heart. That's the sort of philosophy culture they live. And everybody of us, we are doing that. Uh, of course, I had also opportunity to be with uh, Dr. V for some time. He is the one who induced me to start postgraduate program in HVSI hospital fellowships. And uh, I remember last, uh, when I met him two days before he passed away, I went to him. And uh, he blessed me while going from uh, taking a, uh, this, from, you know, I will pass going as tying my shoelace. He gave a wry smile, as you know, normally it was his style. And he says, Colonel, you can still bend down. I said, Sir, I learned a lesson from you. From today, I'll be modest in my life. Now, community, I can, as I tell you, in army, there's no room for that. I went to commandant to take permission. He said, No, there may be infection. I don't want to take a risk. I'm in a promotion zone. So there's no uh, end. So I told him, sir, I'm going ahead. If infection occurs, problem occurs, I'm not taking your permission, you can court martial me. If something is good, you can come and preside you the spectacles. So that's how it started. And uh, philosophy is selfless work you have to do. You don't, then uh, post-retirement, either I could go to a medical college. I found I went there and in eight days I got you know, uh, disinterested because there's no work there. They just wanted a professor to have postgraduates. Then Dr. V called me. He wanted me to join Madurai. Somehow I lost that opportunity. Anyway, there's another person, great person, visionary Mr. Pandya, who was blind. He called me and asked me to do these thousand surgeries in a small setup in a blind woman's hostel where there was a, a one small operation theater. So I said yes and uh, joined him. 
uh, you know, those days he, he used to think big, always used to think big, and uh, he was a great sort of resource uh, mobilizer. Then initially we had only camp approach. We used to do two, twice or thrice a day, week uh, surgeries, about 30, 40 surgeries we do, about two of us. And like that, we reached, uh, then shifted to new location. And uh, only motivation doesn't help. We have to have, you know, vision, mission described. And uh, we need to have good financial backing because only cataract may give you a pat on the back, but doesn't earn you any respect. We have to develop the specialities. And uh, that is the biggest task. It was forming a core team, and it was a Lagan team. Most of them had joined after his po their post-graduation from the various medical colleges. And uh, to send them to various institutes, a lot of problems came. I went to send some uh, uh, girls, you know, their uh, parents came to me. Sir, you are sending them for two years for training. What happens for marriage? I said, let them go get married. Let them not come back to me. At least let them learn the skills. So with that, we sent them. Of course, all of them, they came back. Of course, Parishit is sitting with me. Initially, he gave a lot of help. Then, what we thought, then uh, growth, you know, we should have, well, during that time, one professor from IIM Ahmedabad came and talked to me. I was very fanatic about doing free surgeries alone. He said, no, you have to have a mix of both. And uh, uh, that time, I didn't like him. But then I realized that, he told me that when money comes, you are growing, money will come to you. With money, thoughts will come to you. And also, some compulsion thoughts will come to you. You have to follow that. But having accepting all these things, remember, you should not deviate from your mission and vision. So that's very, very important. That's why your past, your money, and your people can influence your growth and development. INGOs are like, you know, I always I tell a story. INGOs, when they help, they do your overall development. It's like an old lady, she wanted to have, invited a king to have food with her. And the king accepted. When king wanted to go there, he found out whether there any house there. So there was no house. So they built a house. They built a grocery. They built a furniture. Similarly, when INGO comes in, there's overall development. You have it. So we had a lot of uh, INGO support. With that, we developed. And we never say no to any development program. Of course, inventory control is the most important because the philosophy is resource saved is resource scale. And we used to have the monthly maintenance forecast and uh, have a very, very small sort of a store because uh, so that we should not lock our money. Then vendors uh, selection and vendor loyalty we had for a long time so we could give, buy it and all this thing. But most important is equipments. We have to give ownership to people because unless we give ownership of the equipment to people, they won't be okay because nobody is responsible. But multiple users are there. So, but at the same time, we have to be very, very optimized. Education, they say in Vedas, when you want to give education, there's a, of course, Vedas is knowledge. And they say when curiosity is there, athato brahma jidnyasa. Whenever there is a brahma jidnyasa, what should you do? Gachche samitpani shotriya, brahmanishta. They, they say go to a person who has a knowledge of theory and also have a knowledge of pr uh, uh, practicals. Then only he will be able to teach you. And then when you go there, how should a teacher behave, student behave with the teacher? They say, Nirlajjo Guru Sannidho. That means, when you are with the Guru, never hesitate to ask questions. Learn whatever you can. If you hesitate, you will not learn. You will not have knowledge. And how do you serve him? Not like uh, what we do today. They say, Pariprashnena Sevaya. Go on asking questions. After the question, till such time, it, time comes when they say, Gurus to Maunam, Shishyas to Chinna Samshaya. You make them think. Don't give them sort of a dole. Make them think. And a stage comes, whenever you have got a question in mind and look at your guru, he doesn't answer, but answer comes back to you. So this is what research we should have, uh, education we should have. Skill transfer, fellowships, paramedical education. Then, uh, and ultimately, every teacher in the past, I don't know what about present, we have a desire in their mind that I should be defeated by my student. He should become better than me. With that sort of uh, ambition one should uh, teach, and this innovation we should always have, so that in education, in service, in science, so uh, this is very good. Then when you develop your HR, you have to give them opportunities to grow, in-service opportunities, you have to have flexible HR policy. Then in a difficult situation, you find that some of the HR, they create problems for you, they can be dangerous. Contain that problem. 
Like this is a situation in a minefield, a soldier is going on with a donkey. He can ride the donkey, but donkey can kill him because he can step on a mine, minefield. He cannot let loose that donkey. Similarly, there are some HR, we have to carry them with you so that they don't create problems for you. Uh, development is one thing, you have to think big. This one small poem I got to know, uh, I, I put it here, if you can't be a pine tree on the top of a hill, be a strong shrub in the valley. Be the best little shrub by the side of a hill. It is, no, it is not a size that you win or lose, fail. Be the best, whatever you are. Then, of course, vision building and all, they came with a sort of a Vision 2020, INGO support, Arvind. We got all those, those things, you know, learned, made our plan, our vision, mission, strategic plans. Then with the Seva International, we have been mentoring hospitals. So just, you know, when you teach others, you learn. They say, how do you learn? In Vedic sciences, they say, adhyan, adhyapanam, adhyan. You learn, you teach. When you're teaching, you're learning yourself. So when you're doing mentoring, we are learning ourselves and we improved ourselves. Then, uh, like your, uh, I don't talk much, but about uh, your, uh, you need to have resources. Generate, you know, uh, your, your uh, finance so that you run properly. And in your hospitals, you should have like this, your earning and spending should be equal at least. The rest you can manage by donations. Then uh, problem comes when you grow. When you grow, a problem comes when there is a sense of complacency comes in. People's expectations become more. More wages they ask. A plateau stage comes in because, you know, there's nothing much interest, you know, there's nothing to do. A routine work becomes. So that is the time you have to be very, very important. They say, ma manusara yuddhacha. Always you are having a uh, ladai, you know, what that war with yourself, war means, you know, you have to have situations. And how do you come, uh, uh, then, you know, expenses increase, your equipment need to have, buy one, many. Then all those things cost money, research, education, quality, everything costs money. And your whole mathematics goes heavy. <laughs> so when that time, I think, how do you manage is, you should have strong philosophy, culture, value system of your hospital. And uh, we are having that. Then recognize the genuine need of the people. Satisfy that. Then partnership in administration. You have to give them the partnership in administration because they need not go on working, you know, alone and secluded. Make them feel, make them a part of administration. What is administration? It's not a separate something. Then partnership at national level, international level, and uh, professional satisfaction is one. Each and everybody must have it. Then only they stood to stay together. And last is development of spiritual quotient, like our president he had. Then the post-COVID, a lot of things have happened now. The cost of basic surgery has increased, which nobody knows, even government doesn't know it. We have to have adequacy with the government that cost of surgery is going to go on increasing day by day. And procedure also, why, why SICS to people, why not FACO? All those things are going to come, and that is a part of the Vision 2020 and AIOS has to do their job. Then uh, cost recovery is again becoming uh, difficult because uh, everything is increasing. So the HR cost, I think, is, is going as high as about 55% to more than that even sometimes. So then uh, need to have, as told, adequacy with the donors also because donors must know that it costs money to do a particular job. INGOs. Then, of course, the one question has started looming in everybody's mind, what happens if similar pandemic or war comes in? We have a system in army that we have a crisis expansion plan. Whenever there's something, you know, goes bad, we need to have crisis, we have expansion plan. Similarly, we should have a crisis management plan of say 30 to 20 percent reserve. And that can be kept for things like pandemic. I, I, look, I got this sort of a picture when during the flood, everything was lost. Look at a smile, what a confidence. He lost everything, but still he believes he can stitch life again. With that spirit, I think we can take, tackle the all pandemics. You know? And lastly, I perform this Agnihotra where it says, Idanna Mama, it is not mine, I am trusted to it. With this philosophy in mind, I think you can achieve whatever we are. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for the wonderful talk.
we come to our next oration and that is the named oration after Dr. S.S. Badrinath, my guru. Dr. S.S. Badrinath is the founder and chairman emeritus of Shankar Netralia, Chennai, one of the largest charitable eye hospitals. He was elected a fellow of the National Academy of Medical Sciences. He received Padma Bhushan, the third highest civilian award of the Republic of India in 1996. Also received many other awards, including Padma Shri and Dr. B.C. Roy Award. He has built Shankar Netrale and a, a pinnacle of the eye hospital, which has served the needy, which has given education to so many fellows across the whole of the country as well as they who are scattered in the world today. We have this AIS endowment lecture named after him and it is my great pleasure to call upon Dr. Professor Rajwardhan Azad sir to come up and deliver the lecture. Dr. Rajwardhan Azad was Professor and Head of Vitroretina and Ocular Trauma Unit. He also worked as Consultant Vitroretina Surgeon, Ministry of Health in Kuwait. And Dr. Azad was awarded the first SARC conference of ophthalmologists for his outstanding contribution of, in ophthalmology in SARC region in Kathmandu in 1991. <coughs> He is recipient of the Dr. C. N. Shroff Award for the best retinal work in India. I think and we are short of time. Yes. So I think it's better I start. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank, uh, you, thank sir. you very much, uh, Partha, and uh, all the AS team for, for having honored with this uh, Dr. S. S. Badrinath Endowment Lecture. Indeed, this is a most prestigious lecture. And before going on to the lecture, I'm just a small video. From a very small organization to a big organization. All this has been possible uh, can you from audio the sound which you have audio created, visual both from internal accruals uh. as well as from the donations we have received from the community. Had it not been for the support which we have received from the community, I don't think we could have grown as fast as we have done over the years. So this is the philosophy of ophthalmology. The philosophy of ophthalmology is basically to serve people, to serve people through the expertise that you have got during your training, got from your teachers, even got from your patients, and got from the society. When this topic was given to me, science of ophthalmology and my philosophy, it baffled me. And in fact, I was just thinking, who is the person who has, <laughs> you know, selected this topic? And my mind was going on and on and on what to speak on this topic. And then I thought that I'm sick of talking on vitro-retinal surgery. I'm sick of talking on AMDs and retinopathy of prematurity. I will talk something, you know, which is a little bit different. Science of ophthalmology is based on evidence. It's not the ophthalmology, but entire science is based on evidence. But there is a difference. What is the difference? Different, we are open. By open, I mean I can see inside the patient's eye, and the patient can see me, you know, through the through his uh, you know eye. So that is the openness which the science has, and of course, that is because it is full of evidence. It's not going. Yes. What is the philosophy of science? If you ask me what is my philosophy of science is, my philosophy of science is mystery. How this universe was formed, you know the Big Bang Theory. The Big Bang Theory says that it started with a small, you know, kind of a balloon and this balloon is going, going, going and going and one day it will burst, will burst. and when it will burst, the world will be over. So that is the mystery of science, and that is the mystery of uh, 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 universe. And this is the truth. So this leads us to unravel the truth and make people to understand what is a particular subject is. And I am working on the logic behind. What are the theories of the vision? 
the theories of the vision is, do our eyes show us the truth or does our eyesight contrive for us some approximation? Can we even show that what we experience is more than a belief, even as much as much as can approximation? The theory of vision is emission versus extramission. What is an emission? An emission says that there is an eye, and through the eye, the light goes out. And when the light, light goes out, the image is seen, and it comes back, and it is perceived. But it is not simple emission or extramission. There is an intromission. Intromission means the object is outside, and the object throws the you know, the rays inside the eye, and it is perceived by the retina and goes on to the mind's eye, that is the visual cortex. So that is the theory of vision. If you ask me what is the philosophy of thermology, the philosophy of thermology which was set by our forefathers. By my, by my forefather, I mean the forefather of the ophthalmology, and that is Susurta Samhita, which contains 184 chapters with description over 1,100 illnesses, 700 medical plants, and numerous other medicinal preparations. He dis di described diabetes and angina, linking angina to obesity and recommending. See this he did in 800 BC. In 800 BC, Susurta described 76 ocular disease, as I told you. And then that other people also, like Ibn al Haytham, you know, uh, in Basra, Iraq, was a scientist who played an important role in Middle Age Islam world. And Pythagoras proposed that sight is caused by visual rays emanating from the eye and striking objects. So these are the, you know, the philosophy of history of our ophthalmology. What is third eye? Third eye is the third eye of Lord Shiva. The one eye sees the exterior. This means he is the external affairs minister. The other eye sees inside, which does the introspection. And there is one more eye. The eye which warns you that you should not do this and you should do this. So that is the third eye. And that third eye of Lord Shiva is the eye, you know, which is the controlling power. The power of controlling the humanity, the power of controlling the social order, the power of controlling the religion, and the power of controlling the universe. So that is the third eye. The philosophy of ophthalmology, there is a spiritual, as I told you, the Triambakam. Om Triyamakam Yajamahe Sugandhi Pushtivardhanam and so on. And the other one is metaphysical. What is metaphysical? Metaphysical is not just seeing, you know. Eyesight is for seeing. The metaphysical is what you are seeing is, you know, being controlled by your mind, by the by 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 by, by, by your uh, you know brain. And, you know, embryologically we know that the eye is a part of the brain. So there is the connection, the physical and metaphysical connection. And physical, of course, we know the, what we are seeing through the eye, the rays are entering in the eye, lens is allowing it to go inside, the retina is perceiving, and so on and so forth. So that is the physical part. Now see this, you know, the... The, the, the aging. The aging has got effect in eye also. It's not simply body. And this is a godly phenomenon. This is not under our control. Cognition. When a child, you know, seven, eight months child, sees the, her, his mother or her mother, there is a smile on his face. And this smile of face is the face, is the smile of cognition. And this is what is, you know, the godly phenomenon is a, something which is godly. And then, eyes are the most valuable organ of expression. 
if you are sad you weep if you are happy your eyes express so from eyes only you know you know that the love has started and from eyes only you know that this is going to be your partner so the eyes have got a very very important philosophical role and the social role cultural role in our life somebody asked people no so lot of lots of uh, young people ask me come sir shall i join ophthalmology i said this is your choice i am not going to force on you but then i'll tell you something that i in ophthalmology there is a lot of element of charity and when there is a charity there is a gratitude also there is a wow effect you do the cataract and the next day the patient has got vision and the patient say doctor you are a god somebody who has not seen and you have given the vision that the patient says that you are a god and that is the wow effect immediate effect the immediate effect on his mental condition and you get a lot of gratitude so that is our you know science of ophthalmology and there is a openness everything is visible and now ophthalmology is a you know something is a very advanced science we have medicine and we have surgery also and we have emergency also and we have don't have emergency also so that is the beauty of ophthalmology and that is what i tell my you know young colleagues you know i also tell them that look if somebody has had had no illness in his life but he will definitely get a cataract above the age of 50 60 years he will come to abhava savada or he will come to jagatram or he will even come to me but i'll refer to them the <laughs> somebody over 50 40 years he will may have glaucoma and now glaucoma is increasing some all you know if you go to school for school screening you will find out of 100 child almost you know 30 40 of them requiring glasses refractive error and of course presbyopia everybody has to have presbyopia no one can say after the age of 40 years that i am yes i'll conclude so uh, i i no no one, no no one will say that i don't need glasses so above all aging group and lifestyle diseases and ophthalmology is a science a small science where we have small instrument small eye and small inserts small with small opening we are operating these days and therefore some people say an ophthalmologist is a goldsmith and an orthopedic surgeon is an iron smith <coughs> and of course we have day care programs jagatram has already told about them you know the community of ophthalmology and the national survey we have brought down the blindness to 0.6% there is a program for diabetic retinopathy and many other conditions there is a lot of uh, talk about the it trans- uh, information technology and that is transforming our ophthalmological science there is an artificial intelligence there is a digital imaging large large image of the fundus and the pediatric retinal fundus camera of course all india ophthalmological society is a main body and this is all about the great institutions are there the apex institutions and other institutions we all see and we all meet our colleagues in all these meetings the indian trade we must talk about the indian trade the indian trade is one of the best trade in the world i can tell you of ophthalmological trade we have lot of low cost technology instruments are there which has routinely used multifocal iuls with tecme machines red cam camera wide field fundus angiography oct and octa all these are now available with our indian manufacturers and of course the research is something which is very important and something which is which i am working on is the optic nerve regeneration and later it may be converted into optic nerve transplant we have got a project sanction from the in- indian council of medical research and we are soon going to get the next know, time on philosophy talk an eye for an eye, eye, for eye. the morality of revenge revenge is immoral and is savage nonsense there. victims have the right to revenge or at least the right to have government exact revenge for them so underneath that kind and gentle stupid. exterior beats the savage drums of revenge you got it an eye for an eye next time on philosophy talk
So those about to study the medicine, the youngest, uh, younger physicians should light their torch at the fires of the ancients. Of course, these are the, you know, and the last but not the least is my philosophy. The first one was the Dr. Badrinath's philosophy, and it is ending with my philosophy, help others even when you know that they can't help you back. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, sir, for that wonderful talk, sir. Uh, may we have all the uh, endowment uh, professors for a photograph, sir? <laughs>